Thank you for joining me today. Today, we're going to start a series. It's an interview with, with a good friend of mine, Jim Barfield. He's a well-known archaeologist, very unique archaeologist, as you're going to find as we do the interview. But what's so exciting about this is because he's really a treasure hunter. I use that in quote marks because he doesn't like to call it a treasure hunter. He's really a, a scripture a detective. He looks at scripture, he looks at what's taking place, and he tries to follow the clues. He's got a background as a fire investigator, so he's really good at investigating the, the scene, investigating the evidence. But I think this is a great story, and, and here's why. Because one of the, the, the neat things that takes place in the Bible, in the book of Ezekiel chapter 38, it talks about how that the enemies of Israel come against Israel, and they come to take a spoil, to take a great gain, and then it even mentions silver and gold. And people have guessed, what is this? Is it the wealth of the Dead Sea? Or is it oil that that's, could be in the ground? Because many people think oil is there, and already we found great loads of gas. But could there also be gold and silver? And so following the clues of the Dead Sea Scrolls, Mr. Barfield will give us a suggestion of what this might be and why there's so much interest in the Qumran caves. You know, I've been there earlier with a man by the name of Vindo Jones who became part of the Indiana Jones and the, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. But let me tell you, when you see these next several stories concerning the treasures in the desert and how God's word is being fulfilled and there's incredible interest in this going on, especially as we see the interest in the Middle East building to a, a boiling point in terms of the enemies of Israel coming against her. And, and what is that treasure? Why, why is there such a, a feud over Jerusalem and the Temple Mount? And this story blends in so well with the ashes of the red heifer, the fact that there's four red cows in Israel right now ready to sacrifice. You see, all these things are coming together in a very unique way. Well, enjoy the interview. We have four parts, and I think week by week you're going to understand the excitement of the last days. I really think that Christ could come at any time. And this is one of the reasons, because we're looking at what's taking place in the Middle East, in archaeology, in politics, in war. Every area brings together the unique timing of all these events for the end days. Here's our interview with Jim Barfield. me today. I promise that you're going to enjoy this program. Matter of fact, we've been waiting some time to do this because we have a special guest. And so I want to introduce to you Jim Barfield. Jim, welcome to, to Bible Truth and Prophecy. Well, thank you very much. And I'm, I honestly, I'm honored to be here. So thank you for having me. You know, um, I want people to, to learn a little bit about you first. And um, I know we kind of cross paths back in the, the days when uh, my audience will know a man by the name of Vindel Jones. Mm -hmm. And of course, some of them know him as Indiana Jones, but, mm -hmm. but, um, but I kind of fell in love with the whole idea of, of the caves there in the Qumran area. And, um, and really, that kind of stirred a passion with me because I felt like, um, how can I prove the Bible to people? You know, I read the Bible, I like reading the Bible, I like studying the Bible, but some people, they don't like to read. and so. So we found that through current events, some people say, wow, if that's what the Bible says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a look at the Bible. And some through rocks and stones and archaeology say, wow, if that's what the Bible said and that's what we're finding, I can look at that. So how did you kind of get started in the, this whole idea of uh, Israel and looking in, in caves and so on? Well, I, honestly, I had no intention of going to Israel or do anything like that. What happened was... I was doing a, a study, I do chronology research as well, and I had an opportunity to go to Bendel Jones's house and talk to him about my research. Well, when I got there, he just took over, and he wanted to talk about the Copper Scroll, and I'm glad he did. I mean, I got to speak to him about what I needed to, but he got to talking about this Copper Scroll, explain things. I didn't understand his research. Uh, I think the world of the guy, but I didn't understand his research. But I got to listening to him, and I thought, you know what? 
uh, I was an investigator with the fire marshal's office in Lawton, Oklahoma, and I did well. I was investigator of the year for Oklahoma and international investigator of the year. So I did okay at it. But my skills that I learned how to do investigation didn't come from a school somewhere. Mm -hmm. It came from my Bible studies because yeah. mm -hmm. I love Bible study. And I learned how to evaluate and look and determine, you know, what's important, what's not. That's how I got in, interested in the Copper Scroll, which led me, eventually led me to Israel. My wife and I left for Israel, I think it was 2006. We headed for Israel, 2007, something like that. <coughs> we headed for Israel, and she had a backpack, I had a backpack, and we were living on a fireman's retirement money. Uh, so we were tight on money. And we went to Israel so I could look at the location that I had determined is where all these items on this copper scroll, what the copper scroll is, real quick version of it is, it's a literal or a verbal map describing the locations of 50 hordes of immense treasures, artifacts from the tabernacle and the temple, Solomon's temple. A lot of the uh, scholars believe it was, uh, this scroll was written in uh, the time of uh, Herod's temple. It wasn't, mm -hmm. All of it was written during the time of uh, Solomon's temple. Mm -hmm. But that's what got me to Israel, is my first trip to go over there and determine if what, my, what I was seeing on my research was correct. We have some things in common, and, uh, and sometimes I think that's good for people to know. Um, I, I, I have a passion about the Bible. And uh, matter of fact, you, you and I were talking about my Bible has a few markers in it. And, uh, and the people on VTIP, they, whenever they see it, I, we even get comments. How come you got so many markers in there? Well, I'm always working on a, today's message and tomorrow's message and the next one. And I'm reading and I teach a Bible class. So we share this. We, we both love God's Word. Mm -hmm. We share this. We, we, we love the country of Israel, the nation of Israel, and the people of Israel. And I think the other thing is um, what we'd really like to see is we'd like to see people introduced to the truth. And the truth, the Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's Jesus. And I think today, um, sometimes I see people go to Israel for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's for a vacation. And that's okay. But, but really, I, I like to take people to Israel to find the truth. You know, the, the truth will set you free. And um, so, so when um, I, I've got to ask you this question, so people might say, okay, Jim, um, yeah, we see that you love the Bible. We see that you love Israel, the people of Israel, but you're a treasure hunter. How do you respond to that? I tell them no way. Yeah. That is not what I'm doing this yeah. for. Uh, it, it is a lot of treasure. Let's be honest about it. It's ancient treasure, which even makes it more and the, and the story behind it makes it even more valuable. But the value is for this treasure is one thing, oh, far above the gold, silver, and gems, is the biblical knowledge that could potentially be buried there at Qumran, inside mm -hmm. of a cave. And the artifacts, there's a possibility that's within this particular cave, and we'll talk about it today, uh, is the tabernacle of Moses. If that's in there, it's, the, it's, it's knowledge and information about the scripture is going to go off the charts. But that's the real treasure, mm. is the, and the, what's coming in the future. I, and I told some of you guys earlier, I said, I just got a brand new great-grandson. That's what I'm doing it for. Mm. Because uh, during the millennial reign, we're going to have a king, a righteous king, that's going to rule over my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren's grandchildren. -grandchildren's that's what this is all about. So, so let me ask you a couple of really tough questions. For example, do you honestly think that there's gold and silver in the caves that, that you're looking at? One particular cave, yes. The rest of it is, is actually buried within the ruins of Qumran. There's like uh, 56, wow. uh, 55 locations within the ruins. Yeah. And, and before we're done with our, our show, are we going to have the opportunity to, to see where some of those caves are located? Oh, yeah. I'm going to show you where it's at. I'm going to go get you a shovel and send you that direction. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm not kidding myself. This is so exciting. Now, in terms of other things that you find there, what about uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant? Do you think it might be there? The only thing that, uh, one of the things that it names, and I think we're going to cover that today, is um, the Ephod. The breastplate. Mm -hmm. It literally names that location. Location number three is where it's at. 
inside of a cave. But the, the tabernacle and all the, the, the house, uh, treasures of the house, which it says in the very last location, treasures of the, house, the treasures of the house are not gold and silver that you melt down and turn. It's the, the uh, tabernacle. It's the table of showbread, altar of incense. All of the things that, that are housed within a tabernacle. I believe the whole tabernacle and all the implants, including the Ark of the Covenant. And, and then what about the Kalil, the, the, the clay pot that, that held ashes of the cremated red heifer based on Numbers 19? Is there a possibility that that may be at this location? Oh, I think absolutely. Because you're going to bury all the things that you need for the coming temple. You're going to have some instructions there for one thing. Mm -hmm. And also you've got to have the cleaning material, which is what the Kalil is. It's the ashes of the red heifer. Now let's say, I may be jumping ahead, but let's say that they do have a, a red heifer sacrificed here within the next few months, mm -hmm. which I think is entirely probable. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that, from what I understand, I could be wrong. They, they would take the ashes of the new red heifer, put it in with the ashes of nine red heifers back, and they mix it together. That way you have, literally have ashes from the first red heifer, second, all the way to this one, which yeah. would be the tenth. One of my questions to you is going to be, uh, as we read Numbers 19, I know you spent time studying, mm -hmm. I've spent time studying it. Sometimes I, I try to go and, and read through it every day, every day, the, the whole passage for a month, just so that I have it impacted my brain. But it talks about how it's a perpetual statute. And so there's really kind of two divisions. Some people think, okay, we can get the new red heifers and, and the audience that watches us regularly, they know that there's five there now. Uh, they, they may be suitable, they, they may be cremated any time, but, but there are some who say we can start again right now. Others say no, since <clears throat> it's perpetual, we really need to find this original Kalil because, because if this is the 10th the one that's getting ready to be cremated, according to the Jewish tradition, when they ran out of ashes for number two, they, they, when they cremated cow number two, red heifer number two, they put the Kalil on top of that. So some of the ashes in that mm -hmm. new pot are original all the way mm -hmm. back from the days of Moses. And, and so there's kind of two denominations there, but, but I think that's why the intensity for uh, looking for this Kalil is there. Uh, now, but, but like you say, Jim, these are treasures more than just dollars and cents. They're treasures because they're, they're antiquities. They're treasures really because if, if those items any of those items were found, it lends validity to this book, the Bible, you because bet. we go back not hundreds of years, we go back several thousand years, mm -hmm. and we say, look, the Bible says this, it's so accurate, we're, we're digging this up. Something 4,000 years ago is being dug up today, and it's exactly what the Bible says. So if it's exactly true there, it must be true everywhere. Um, so how are you going to profit from this? You say you're not a treasure hunter. And so let's say you find one of these items. Is it going to be, is it going to be in the Jim Barfield Museum? No. No. <laughs> There's, I will get nothing from uh, certainly in those items that are there. Those belong to God. Matter of fact, I had a rabbi tell me. I was sitting in Jerusalem, downtown Jerusalem, near Kikar Zion, which is Zion Square. Uh, I went to his office. And he sat down with me, and he, when he realized what I'd found, he was ecstatic. He literally got in his chair and picked me up and kissed me on both cheeks. He said, do you know what this is? And I said, yeah, it's the treasures of the Solomon's temple. And he said, it's more than that. He said, these items are the, the dowry for the coming bride. And mm. that shocked wow. me yeah. that he would say that. And because I'm, I'm thinking of us here in America, we think about the dowry for the bride. Of course, they're part of the bride. Mm -hmm. So now we've, uh, we've, we've got a treasure that I will have no right to touch. Um, I, they will certainly need me to find all of them because I've got all the, the cards showing where to find them. But the great reward that I get is uh, the security of knowing when I pass, my grandchildren will be mm -hmm. uh, led by a righteous king. So I, I told people, okay, we have some things that we really share in common. It'd be the Bible, it'd be mm -hmm. Israel, it'd be the, the truth of, of Yeshua, the Messiah. And I think it's also this, um, the, the fact that, that really you're not, 
you're not trying to get a treasure. You're not trying to get wealthy no. from this. No. And uh, you and I were talking ahead of time that, that in my mind, I look at it a little bit like the story in Daniel chapter 5. And here's Belshazzar, and, and he wants to have an exciting party. And so he says, okay, let's, let's add to the excitement. He said, go get the vessels of gold and silver that were taken out of the house mm -hmm. of God. They, they belonged to God. They were dedicated to God. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I even find in Jeremiah where, where God judged Babylon because they stole treasure from his house. Mm -hmm. And so this treasure belongs to God. Mm -hmm. And so how dare we take it and say, this is our treasure. Uh, and, and God saw fit to destroy Belshazzar and destroy Babylon that very night that they mocked by, mm -hmm. by drinking out of those vessels that belonged to God, saying these are ours, and, and they, mm -hmm. they made him like a, a, a party. Um, I think that's important for people to know that our point really is to, is to show the validity of God's Word. Yes. To show the reality that the things that we've got recorded in the Bible, these are true. And, and from time to time, God unveils some of these. The, the, the cornerstones of the, the temple in Shiloh, a good friend of ours is involved mm -hmm. in that. Wow. When I see that, I, I have people that were skeptics and they see that and say, oh my goodness, I, I better look at that again. And I think this is going to cause some skeptics to say, I better look at that again. And so, well, uh, go to the next slide because on there it talks about the, the Copper Scroll Project. And um, I think people hear about the Copper Scrolls, uh, but really you're probably the expert in the Copper Scrolls. I know there's some really good books on it, but it kind of explain to us because when we think of the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are some people, they think the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in the water. <laughs> because it says Dead Sea, and, yeah. and, uh, and so then, but the Copper Scrolls are different than the rest of the, the, the manuscripts in, in some of the, the scrolls found in the Dead Sea Project, and maybe explain the, the meaning of the Copper Scrolls. What, what is that? Yeah, the Copper Scroll is the only thing really different about, well, a couple of things, is that it's made out of copper, literally made out of copper. It's three sheets of copper, and they're about oh, two and a half feet approximately long each sheet, and they're, they were riveted together. They call them copper scrolls because it looks like there's two scrolls. It's not. It's just one. Mm -hmm. It broke when they were trying to roll it mm -hmm. up. And I think it was Jeremiah and, and the guys. Haggai, Zechariah were two of the guys that broke the copper scroll. How many guys all together? Five. Five. Mm -hmm. uh, three of them, I don't really know who they are. <coughs> but they are the ones that, um, uh, that actually wrote on the copper scroll. Now, the scroll was, it's about approximately seven feet long, and it's got 12 columns of, of literature on it. It's information, and all it is is a description. Uh, it says, in, in, the, in the Valley can, of Accor. Can we see what, what that might look like? Yeah. And it talks about the, uh, the things that uh, we hope to be able to find. Well, here's, here's what we're, I'm going to try to reveal to you guys today. Yeah, great. Um, I believe that Qumran holds the diary for the coming bride. I want to show people how uh, important and how Qumran is a holy place. And I think whenever these things are found, if in fact I'm correct, it will be number two only to the temple itself. Qumran was once a miniature Jerusalem in the wilderness, and I'll show you that here mm. in just a little bit. Uh, and we did some testing with a very powerful metal detector. And I'm going to show you the results, uh, some of the results of that. Uh, and I'm excited about that because, you know, you could be a pedestrian. And when you see some of the results that you've got on that, uh, I, no, one, no one can turn their head from that. That's how, that's how impressive that is. So I'm, I'm yeah. excited for people to look at that. And there's more. There's more to the facts of claiming that the uh, cover scroll is legitimate. And those items are actually there. But the last one, uh, the last two, there's mortar at the cave, where I think the cave is. Had it tested by two organizations. One was a, 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 a mortar expert from Israel. He said, yeah, this is man-made. And uh, CTL group out of Illinois tested it. And they gave me a thumbs up. Probabilities are high that this is man-made. Mm -hmm. And the last thing, <coughs> the term of endearment that's embedded in this copper scroll. There's seven Greek words uh, that are on the Copper Scroll in different locations. We'll see that. And it, those seven uh, actually give a term of endearment, and we'll cover that here in a few minutes. Okay, great. This is what the Copper Scroll looked like when it was found. 
It was on a shelf inside of a cave three. And this is what it looked like. It's about seven feet long, one foot wide. This is it once it was unrolled. They had to unroll it by cutting it, cutting it open mm -hmm. and, or slicing it. When they pieced it back together, <coughs> this is what they came up with. And again, if you'll now, notice... All the, other, all the other scrolls are really uh, typical scrolls, skins of an animal or paper with writings, and they, and they cover a, a variety of things. Some have to do with merchants, some yeah. have to do with what we'd say uh, would be songs or lyrics, some I think are contracts. But, but this one... Strictly instructions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's unique in the fact that it's the only one that's copper, mm -hmm. as best I know. All the others were, were kind of typical scrolls, but also unique because the, the message was very pointed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the other thing is, I, I'm not an expert on the scrolls like you are, but the fact that, that we're pretty sure that there's multiple authors, that's not true of, of most of the other scrolls. No, and they, there may have been different scribes, but the same author. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, there's uh, some, one of them that literally says that uh, Baruch uh, was a scribe and Jeremiah was the author. Jeremiah is deeply uh, yes. embedded mm -hmm. in this yeah. scroll too. Yeah. So you can see the handwriting changes on here. There are five writers. Now look at the, the third column right there, how big it is. And then look over here at the, in the far mm -hmm. left-hand side. Just yeah. tiny, uh, whoever wrote that just uh, had a very small handwriting. Mm -hmm. Here's a, a larger picture of it. See these ones with the red marks on it? Those are the Greek words. And I'll, I'll tell you what they mean here in just a little bit. But there are seven of them. <coughs> you only see five. Oops. You only see five here, or six there, and then one on column number four. Mm -hmm. So we're actually on the, the second sheet, uh, or second set of three, which makes up four, four of them, which makes a total of 12 columns. Now, I want to talk a little bit about number six, because that's actually, that's how I got introduced to the Copper Scrolls. Mm -hmm. uh, Vindel had a copy of this, a Xerox copy of something that he had, and and I had that, and, and I looked at it, and I, I wasn't able to read it. I couldn't even go letter by letter. But, but essentially, he talked about that being the, a cave of two openings and a dry riverbed and so on like that. Is, is that still what might be true, or is that a, was that a, his interpretation? I, with all due respect to Bendel, uh, I, I don't think that at all is what that is. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's, he thought it was a location, what he called the uh, cave of the column. Mm -hmm. And but, I've been there, yeah. and, I, and I've dug in there, and I've also been there when it's so hot. I said, I'm not going to dig here because when I tell you, it was yeah, 130 degrees, and all I could do was drink. I mean, I, I had it, I just one bottle of water after another because it was that hot. And, uh, and if people go to, to the Qumran souvenir shop today, where there's some really neat things to, ruins mm -hmm. to look at, um, they'll see that cave because so much debris has been put down beside it. So, so your interpretation is, is different. Very different. Yeah. Uh, the reason being is it says under the ruins in the Valley of Accor. It never tells you to change from those ruins. It just begins to list the 57 locations. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying it's all buried at Qumran. And logic would tell you the same because it, a lot of them at the time that I, when I first started studying this, they thought it was scattered all over Israel. Mm. That's yeah. tons, tons of gold and silver. And all they had was guys and carts to haul this stuff around. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Well, I, I want to talk about that because I think it's important to see that, uh, you know, you've you spent a, a lifetime studying these scrolls. And, uh, and to have God, I'm going to say, reveal it at this time is really pretty unique because I look around at the world mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, I believe that the world's getting ready for judgment. Oh, big time. I'm so glad that, that God put the judgment for my sin on his son mm -hmm. that went to the cross, died and rose again. And, uh, and so how come the world rejects a story of redemption? Well, I think sometimes it's because they're so busy walking past it, they don't see what the truth is. And I look at how many tourists go in and out of the, the cafe there at Qumran, mm -hmm. and I say, folks, do you even know what you're looking at? Uh, they're more interested in, in their ice cream bar. They're more interested in getting in front of the line. And, uh, and so here's some writing. 
obviously somebody thought it was pretty important because they wouldn't have preserved it the way they did on copper on copper and uh, and and made sure it was in a secure location so that it could be found later mm -hmm. uh, they they may have thought that they were going to come back in their lifetime and find it but they also i think because it's copper i said you know what this needs to be preserved for another generation and and maybe we're this generation we are this generation I believe that with all my heart. Good, great. Uh, real quick, I do chronology research. Mm -hmm. The first Jubilee period, 49 years long, Adam. 40 Jubilees later, Isaac. 40 Jubilees later, Yeshua, Jesus. 40 Jubilees later, we're in it. We are in what would be considered a Messianic Jubilee cycle right now. So do I think it's, I think it's here. Yeah, amen. I think it's here. Yeah. Well, every sign in God's Word points that direction. Okay, take us to another. This is the very end of it, and uh, we'll start with the first line of the Copper Scroll. Okay. Under the ruins of the Valley Court, just like I told you, it's, it never changes that location. And it's important uh, because it tells you where to search for the treasures in that certain uh, set of ruins, under the ruins in the Valley of Accor. It's that simple. And it's simply where the ruins are at. Qumran is in the Valley of Accor. Qumran is over here on the far side, but it, it is in the Valley of Accor. So this would be the location that, that I visited, mm -hmm. and, uh, but it's not in that cave. So, so can you see it from that cave? or Are you sure you want to divulge to everybody you bet your I lifetime do. of, of You bet I do. It belongs to all of us. It yeah. belongs to Israel. It belongs to us. Uh, the people that believe in God, so yes, I do want to tell them yeah. about where it's at. They're not going to get the details where they can go when they <laughs> dig, dig at it, but they'll get enough details yeah. that I think and, they'll be satisfied. And, and when we say the Valley of Accor, um, this is something, you know, you didn't make up the title. No, it's that title. That's where, interestingly enough, there was a, that's where a gentleman was killed, him and his family, because he took items, uh, gold, uh, and silver and, and clothing for his family. And there was nothing was supposed to be taken. Yeah. And he got killed and it was in the Valley of Accor, which Accor means Valley of Trouble. Yeah. And, and what is great is that's a story from the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so really the story from the Bible is used as a marker for this incredible story. But isn't it interesting that, that here's a guy who took something that wasn't his, mm -hmm. tried to hide it, tried to say, this is my personal possession. And, and God gave him the land, and God was going to give him even more treasure than that. You cannot give God. But there's something about God that he doesn't like us to steal from him. No. And, and that's, the, that's the trouble, I think, with so many treasure hunters, is uh, they're, they're almost trying to steal. Steal from either God or steal from Israel or steal from the people there. And yet, the, the very story that kind of documents the location mm -hmm. proves exactly the, the opposite. Don't take what's God's. Don't touch it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, matter of fact, if there's implements that we suspect are in that cave, there will need to be Kohanim, which are the priests, Israeli or Jewish priests, that will come in there and, and remove some of the items. Mm. They could be that holy. Yeah. Okay. Here's the, uh, here's the drawing that I used. What I did is I took a picture uh, of Qumran from an aerial picture, <coughs> and, I, and I, I literally traced all this off with a art program on, on my computer. The gray areas you see, the gray splotches you see on there, those are concrete, can't dig there. I did that because I needed to know if I find the location, and I suspect that's where this stuff is buried at, is it possible to even dig there? Mm -hmm. Because this is exactly the same that it was, you know, 2,500 years. Location number one, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Yeah. It says, if you read the bold words with a line underneath it, mm -hmm. that's the translation of it. The above is the actual facsimile, and then it's modern Hebrew, and then it's Strong's concordance uh, of what each word was. And that's how I did this. I got the Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew, uh, wrote it down in modern Hebrew, and then went to a Strong's concordance, found the meaning of it, and wrote it down. Each one of them. So when we talk about you spending a lifetime studying this, we're oh, not yeah. kidding. Because, I, yeah. because this doesn't happen in a few minutes. No, it literally, it took me from uh, December of 2005 or 2006, I'm sorry, 
until June the 22nd of 2007 to get the book completed or yeah. the research completed. So it says, at the steps extending east, 40 cubits long are silver service vessels weighing 17 talents. Wow. How much does a talent weigh? 75 pounds. 75 pounds, okay. Mm -hmm. A lot of gold there, or a lot of silver there. Here are the clues that I went for. As an investigator, I'd find my clues, and then I'd go back and make determinations. First, the steps need to be extending to the east. They have to be 40 cubits long. They're in an area large enough. There's an area large enough to bury 17 talents of silver. Uh, and, uh, again, silver, that much would be about 12, 1,300 pounds, approximately. As I looked at the map, there was only one set of steps heading east. So I thought, I'll try that one. <coughs> Excuse me. I measured it, and it was, a, it, my, uh, my estimation, what I had available, I thought, well, that's 40 cubits long. That can't be. I figured out this within five minutes after I started studying this stuff. Here's an actual uh, scientific drawing done by Yitzhak Magan and Yuval Peleg. They get those, uh, I sat with those guys, with uh, the uh, head of the antiquities, or uh, Shuka Dorfman. He set up a meeting after he saw the first five that I'm going to show you here today. When he saw, no, first four, he stopped me. And he called these guys and said, meet me at uh, Rockefeller Museum. You need to see this. So anyway, I met with these guys, and they had drawn this up. Well, the distance on it <coughs> is 64 feet at 19.2. But anyway, here's your, here's your math up here. The math divides out to be 40 cubits long. Wow. It was wow. like the width of my finger off wow. from being 40 cubits long. This is an old picture that I took years ago. That's where I think the, uh, <coughs> the silver's buried at. Mm -hmm. Now, is this area where the silver is buried, is that one of those areas that, that they concrete over it? They didn't concrete over it, but they put a wooden walkway over it. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, I think they'll probably pull that back long enough to get the silver out from yeah. under it. Location two. That <laughs> is what we expect to find. Not this, uh, literally not this, but about that much gold. Wow. The value, somewhere around 1.5 billion, 2 billion, depending on the price of gold today. Mm -hmm. uh, and these, again, these treasures are not for us. They're for the coming bride, and we've got to be very, very respectful of that. Yeah, and, and I think this is where we see a lot of confusion coming in, because a lot of the people that I know, and I, I know some, some treasure hunters, and, and they're going, you know, every time there's a rock slide, in Israel, new caves are opened up and others are closed. And, and that's how God preserves some of these things because he'd close them up and open them up. But whenever you see this much gold, you're going to have a lot of people looking for it. And even when they found the, the Dead Sea Scrolls you know, back in the, the 50s, when the word got out, I mean, the, the countryside was filled with people yeah. hoping to find any kind of a treasure. Um, and so the potential for that is incredible. Mm -hmm. but, but really, like you, I agree. What this is worth in terms of saying this is documented by the Bible. We're looking at something that God has hidden to be revealed. Uh, you and I were talking beforehand, you know, in the New Testament we have the, the mysteries of the kingdom of God. People think of a mystery like a, a murder mystery. No. Mm -hmm. It means he's going he's gonna to reveal it at his time. There, there's a right time to reveal it. And, and you and I both believe that, that we're approaching that time. But the treasures of Qumran, it actually says diary for the coming bride? No, that's what the rabbi told me. Oh, okay. okay. No, it, yeah. uh, it, no, it's what he told me. Yeah. But he's right. That, that, uh, that was set aside by Jeremiah and his crew, mm -hmm. knowing that they had, they're going to have to rebuild the temple because it already been, or it hadn't been destroyed at that point, but he knew that Babylon was coming. Coming to Jerusalem. He told all of Israel, put your stuff, get your gear together, pack your suitcases, don't fight, just go. And then you'll spend 70 years there. When you come back, then we'll have enough cash 
buried, and, and it literally talks about that in the Copper Scroll. Yeah, and, and let's stop there for a minute on the 70 years. You know, sometimes people say, well, you know, give or take, but, but God revealed to Jeremiah 70 years. Daniel even got that word. He did. And I think that's why Daniel refused to be the, the third ruler of the kingdom. He said, no, I, I, don't, I don't want it. Give your reward to another. And it, it's interesting because the Bible says, and that night the kingdom was taken from, from Babylon and given to the Medes and the Persians to the day. I mean, to the day. Mm -hmm. And so that's how come, I think we have to be careful not to say, well, this is metaphoric. This is, uh, you know, God speaks what he wants to speak. And... Uh, well, there's a lot of secrets. There's, there's a lot to be learned. Um, and real quick, one of the things about Qumran is you've got a, a three-branch branch government in the ancient Israel. You had the executive branch, which was the king, legislative branch, which were the priests, the, the Levitical priests. Mm -hmm. Then you had a judicial branch. Well, where do you see that? The only place you can see that, and the only place that matches that, uh, that, that uh, office is Qumran. Hmm. The judges of Israel, they were prophets. The vast majority of them were prophets. And they had to have a place to meet a Supreme Court. Well, wow. the Supreme Court is Qumran. Hmm. I promise you, there's going to be some amazing things found when, the, when this cave is opened up. And I pray it's going to happen soon. I but, do too. You ready for some more? Okay, I'm ready for more. Yeah. Oops. This is location number two. Accommodated in the built uh, mound of the dry cistern is gold. And the dry fountain of the great root courtyard of the peristyle in the soft mud, which mire is mud, is hidden polished gold. In front of the highest opening are 900 talents. Wow. Mm -hmm. What we're looking for, dry cistern, fountain, mud, uh, highest opening, and a large enclosed courtyard. That's it. There's two courtyards at Qumran. One here where they, right here is where the teacher of righteousness, that was his room. But this was like a place where they'd gather. Even, even mentions that. They, they would gather and they would uh, weeping and crying mm -hmm. over the loss of Israel. But this one is a large courtyard. Courtyard Haggadol. That's where it's at. And the, the fountain is where the water comes in from the west and fills their water system. That's how I found that one, figured it. Mm. Uh, but uh, let me go back one, two. Uh, record your software. Yeah, we'll get to it here in just a second. But that's, that's where that one is buried. Now we're getting to some really interesting stuff. We're gonna get to one in particular. Uh, this is the biggest one of all. We'll get to here in just a few minutes. Uh, that's where the 900 talents are at. See that building? You recognize that building? I do, yeah. <laughs> that is a uh, modern cafeteria for the people that don't know. And my buddy, I tease him about this a lot. I said, every time we go to Israel, he stands right in the middle of that and starts doing a little shifty shifty to try to get the dirts cleared away so you can see what's <laughs> below it. That one's going to be interesting. This is what we used. It's a Lorenz Z1 to, that we scanned this location with. Very powerful, goes down mm -hmm. to 50 feet at least. Mm -hmm. Certainly deep enough to determine what's, <coughs> what's there at Qumran. This is an actual scan. We scanned, uh, well I'm gonna tell you, a gentleman went, went with me to Israel to scan this. His name was Moshe Faglin. He was a deputy, the deputy speaker of the Knesset at the time. Mm. And he heard about this. Long story short, he said, call me when you get to Israel. And I did. I called him and said, I'm here. You ready to go? He said, you bet. We go out there and he scanned it because if I did it, it was illegal. He's got diplomatic immunity. <coughs> we scanned this thing. Look at that. Oh, wow. Green is non-ferrous or is uh, ferrous metals, uh, which is iron. And the blue is gold, silver, and gems, non-ferrous metals. Well, look at that. There's huge amounts buried mm -hmm. at that location. So I can see people right now, they're booking <coughs> their ticket to go to Israel because they, they know it's, it's in location number three. Oh, yeah, you know what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> can you imagine 
the traffic yeah. that they're going to have, if I'm correct, and we go to go there and they, they establish that is a even more important uh, tourist site, and it will be a much yeah. more important. Yeah. Those are the colors, red, green, and orange are the colors that you pick up on that. Blue and red uh, are, and orange are uh, non-ferrous, gold, silver, uh, your more precious metals. Location three, the biggest one of all, or the most important cave of all. Let's read that one. That one says, in the red heap is the wine vessels, or the wine vessels of the gleaming chamber, the ephod, which is the breastplate, and the uh, <coughs> entire tenth of the entire pouring vessels from the treasury. Wow. Red heap, cave, treasury, uh, we'll talk about it in a second. Look at that. That is, the, that, here's Qumran over here. You can see the, uh, the uh, cafeteria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, up here is a red heap. That's not, <coughs> it's pretty, it sticks out like a sore thumb. So it? that over here, this, is that the cave of the column? Uh, no, it's, it's much further down there, probably that, another half mile down that, that way. way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but, but there's so many uh, caves in this area. I mean, you know, sometimes I tell people, count the caves, and they start, you know, they get to 100. And, and so, literally, there's, there's 10,000 caves. That's a lot of caves. And, uh, but this one is very different because this is a red heap. Mm -hmm. It's wow. actually under that. Uh, I, I'm thinking underneath it and to the west, but I don't know for sure. We mm -hmm. won't know till we open it up. But we scan that as well. Here it talked about a gleaming chamber in that second location, um, or third location. This is, this is what it's talking about. That is the tabernacle. That's a picture of the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. Interior picture. Another interior picture. Now, if you had the menorah glowing, that's one thing. But you get the Shekinah glory, glory oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. That would have been a true gleaming chamber. Mm -hmm. Interesting point. One of the secrets about Qumran, about the Copper Scroll, location number one, location number two, location number three. Yeah, right in a line, huh? They're in a straight line. Wow. But that's not all. That's some Indiana Jones stuff there, buddy. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, the treasury. Very important. Uh, tre treasury is talked about several times on the Copper Scroll, and it uses several different names. Citadel, House of a Cause, the treasury the high place, and the house of the slanting guard post treasury. It's named several times by several different writers, mm -hmm. but they're talking about the same building. Mm -hmm. Location four. This is the one where Sheikha Dorfman, the head of the Antiquities, story, uh, Antiquities Authority, stopped me. At the double entry pool, with the entrance on the north edge of the community, six cubits against a white immersion pool, uh, of oblation, which is a mikvah, which is a baptismal, rises from the soil and goes down into the left, and is high above the soft mud mire again, same area. Dig three cubits and find forty silver talents. That one has got so many matching clues. Whenever I, we did finger, uh, we lifted fingerprints uh, when I was doing fire investigation, arson investigation. You got to get them to match. Mm. There are so many points on these. If that were a fingerprint, this guy mm -hmm. was going to jail. Mm. There's so many matching points. These are the points we're looking for. There's 10 of them. If we've got 10 swirls to match and points on a fingerprint, we're doing really good. This is what it actually looks like. Whenever they'd enter into this mikvah, mm -hmm. baptism, they would go down and to the left, just like the instructions say, it was white, it's kind of dingy and dirty here, but it was actually very white at the time of uh, Jeremiah. And guess what? I was trying to determine whether it was a mikvah. Well, there's a sign there. I said, Jimmy, all you gotta do is read the sign, buddy, mm. and you'll know what yeah. the, that's the same sign. Mm. Qumran, this is a very important point about Qumran. I call it Qumruslam. I was looking for a map of Jerusalem at the time of Jeremiah. I found that, and I thought, why in the world did they draw Qumran upside down? Didn't make any sense to me, because 
This is north at Qumran. That's north at Jerusalem. You see they're upside down. Mm -hmm. Well, I rotated the Qumran picture, and look, wow. they match up. Wow. They built Qumran to be a Jerusalem in the wilderness. That's the whole idea behind it. Even the, the wadis match up the uh, valleys in, in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I told you all of that, so let's go on to the next one. Look, the fountain, you see it down the fountain? Mm -hmm. That's called the fountain on the Copper Scroll. That's a fountain gate in Jerusalem. Watch. That again, fountain gate. That, I mean, even the little things that they've got there yeah. match up and, in and, Jerusalem. And I'm sure many of our people <coughs> go to the, to the Holy Land model in Jerusalem. Matter of fact, I, I take my people there twice. I take them at the beginning mm -hmm. so they get a picture of Jerusalem, what it was like. We, we visit because sometimes all that's left of something is a stone or two. or a, And they come back and say, okay, you've got to build this whole building around. So this is a, a wonderful model, really to scale. And uh, so sometimes we can see a, a piece of this. And then you say, okay, here's probably what it looked like in, in that uh -huh. day. And uh, so this is incredible that this would, would match the, the water channel there. And it does, and I'm, I'm going to get up and point at yeah, something. Yeah. Look here, that was the gate mm -hmm. to enter into Jerusalem. And when you entered the gate, you would get in the mikvah. This is the Pool of Siloam, which they're excavating oh, right now. Exciting excavations it going is. on right now. The, the, the finds they've got, if that doesn't prove to the world mm -hmm. that Jerusalem is Jewish, I mean, how, how do you find a, a Jewish coin there? How do you find a, a bell from a rabbi's garment? Mm -hmm. uh, all these things are being found right now. I mean, we're talking right now, this, this year. And uh, so, yeah, so we've, we've been to the Pool of Siloam and, uh, and the street that goes up to the, to the Temple Mount. Yeah. Well, at Qumran, they would enter in through a gate near that double-entry mikvah. They would, they would enter, they'd go down and to the left to get into the pool, and then they go to the, to the left again, go out into, there's a big court here at Qumran, though. But the uh, trench, that fountain, that uh, stream, yep. same, as, same as the one in Jerusalem. Wow. It's, wow. it's amazing. Again, that's a closer picture, a double entry into that mikvah, which again, Pool of Siloam. That's uh, <coughs> pretty much all of them. The fountain, uh, the uh, water system at Jerusalem, the Gion Springs, and if you'll see the column of Boaz there, that's mm -hmm. important because that's where the temple was at. You know, there's a lot of discussion about was it there or was it somewhere else? I think, yeah, absolutely, it was in Jerusalem. Well, if you look over here, there is, and we'll, I think we're going to cover that today, the column of Boaz, it's right here. And literally named that on the Copper Scroll. Wow. And that's where they, right outside of what was considered the holiest place, place, place of the Zadok, and the again, righteous one. You know, the, the Bible documents that the column of Boaz was placed there in the temple, mm -hmm. and it's named. And so, uh, wow, there's, there's got to be some connection if they name it there and we find it here. So, yeah, But all of these locations match that, and you're right. Boaz, <laughs> a very important location. Woman's house matches the woman's gate. Uh, Jaffa matched that bend. That's Jaffa gate. And they even got it there. It makes no sense why they do that. <laughs> and the watch house. We're jumping forward now. Okay. Into this place <coughs> from the eastern pass through the broken house of the slanting guard post treasury. Now listen to the words. There are, uh, there are juice vessels near are all the scrolls and zealous writings of who? Mm. Haggai. Wow. Who did I tell you wrote the Copper Scroll? One of the five? Haggai. Haggai and Zechariah. Contemporaries. By the exterior, dig seven cubits between the two support stones. Those are columns. Um... The rule of all the congregation of Israel for the final days. Now, this is written, uh, this is a rule of the congregation in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, listen to what it says, location number four, or uh, uh, verse four. When they come and they shall see, shall assemble all the <coughs> who are to come, including the children and women, 
and they shall read into their ears all the precepts of the covenant. You had to know the covenant, but you also had to know, as it says here in 7, they shall education, educate him in the book of Haggai. Everyone had to know the book of Haggai. Mm. How long is the book of Haggai? Like two chapters or one. Tiny. You could read it probably yeah. in what? Eight minutes? Oh, yeah. There's something more there. There's another book of Haggai that, if I'm correct, is going to be right there at the entrance. And what does it say? You had to know the book of Haggai before mm. you entered into the community. Where did they bury this? Right there at the entrance. I'll mm. show you. There's all the main points we're looking for. Rubble, that red dot, that's the entrance. The columns, I think we're right there. So in order to get into the community, you have to pass right over the book of Haggai. Wow. All the other descriptions on here match up exactly. You know, when, uh, so this, this looks like the, the Qumran site with the palm trees and all that stuff. It but is. Uh, and... Um, and so this deal here, I've, I've climbed that 50 times or, or 60 or 70, you know, and uh, because, because this is kind of in the area, well, you know, you can see the Dead Sea right there. And, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, this is just incredible. So I've, I've walked over that. Oh, many not, times. Yeah, and not known. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah. Well, you see here that everything matches. Yeah, it's, it's everything's wonderful. matching up except yeah. you see these two white columns. Yeah, they're not there anymore. And I wondered, for goodness sakes, what happened? They, they had to be in big things. Yeah. Well, look and see back over there and uh, by that column on the, on the right. Mm -hmm. There's a gate. Yes. Watch this. You go back there. Look, all the column oh, pieces wow. are still there. Yeah. So wow. the columns have been moved, but they're still at Qumran. Yeah. Again, this is, this is a scan that we did. Okay. Me, Moshe Feglin, and my team. And look at the location. This here is L21, actually, location 21. Mm. It's a massive, massive amount of silver. Mm. And this one is the one that we've been talking about. L32? Yes. That's, if I'm right, that's where Haggai's books are at. And there's uh, some other important precious mm. metals there as mm. well. Yeah. Zealous right. Can you imagine finding the writings of Haggai? Wow. Maybe by his own hand. I don't know. But it would be incredible. And, and like you say, you know, the contemporaries, because whenever you study Zechariah, and Zechariah's, I, I call it the, you know, I call it the ABCs of Bible prophecy. To understand Daniel, to understand Revelation, you need Zechariah. Mm -hmm. Zechariah keeps pointing back to who this mm -hmm. Messiah is. He's going to be sold for three pieces of silver. He's going to be the prophet and priest and king. And, and uh, it's incredible. But you can't study Zechariah without studying Haggai. No. Because the, the, the dates, I mean, the dates mm -hmm. they give you interchange. Yeah. And so these two fit together. But to find that and to say, okay, you know, the Copper Scrolls have been directing us to this. Yeah. The, this, is, this is a great hunt. Great. One other thing that ties those two together is they had to have been little boys when they wrote this because, mm. remember, they came back. Right, yeah. They were the ones yelling at the community saying, build the temple. Quit mm -hmm. building and paneling your houses. Build yeah. the temple. Well, they must have been little boys when they do this. And if you look at the Copper Scroll in detail, the, the handwriting, it looks like one of the guys had a crayon doing that. <laughs> it was, and there's, there's some misspelled words. And maybe that's the way they were spelled at the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, some of the letters were actually uh, printed backwards. Wow. Because they had to write it. A Hebrew write, reads from le uh, right to left. Mm -hmm. They had to flip it over and, and write it from left to right. And they had to write it backwards. My. Because they wanted it to protrude from the document once you flipped it over. Yeah. So the important thing that point I'm getting across though, they were kids. They were just kids when they wrote that or early, probably just past their bar mitzvah. Mm -hmm. They were intelligent young men mm -hmm. because apparently because they had Haggai wrote a document that was so important they buried it there. 
as well. Wow. Location 37. At the edge of the broken residence for anointing the prophets to the edge um, is 60 cubits, and the ditch is 7 cubits deep. That's about 12 feet. Dig and behold the appointed at the appointed time a great quantity. At the, well, that's the key words. Mm. At the appointed time. You know what they were doing? They were saying that they gave this one that long stretch of that long stretch of uh, silver there. That was to be used for Zerubbabel's temple to rebuild mm -hmm. it. Mm. That's what this whole strip was for. And they even wow. named it on there as use this at the appointed time, for the appointed time. Guess what? When we scanned this area, which we did, we scanned it. There's only a small portion right there, like where the 30s at. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, there's a strip probably about eight feet long with, that with silver left in it. And you'll see that. Let me see if we got it here. Again, there's another picture of it. Yeah. See that L37? Mm -hmm. From that wall to that wall. The, the double entry make was over here. The house for anointing the prophets is right here. So I thought that was really interesting. We've got evidence that they used portion of it, just like they, they said they were going to do. And that, this one. Behold, at the appointed time, a great quantity. And they needed money. They needed money for what? They had to rebuild that next temple. Yeah. It was a pathetic little thing, apparently, compared to Solomon's temple. Well, I knew you were going to like our interview with, with Jim Barfield. What a, what a wise man, what an incredible investigation he's got going on. You know, it's interesting because of the timing of this. The timing is very unique. Many things converging together. I think the idea that the whole world seems to be siding against Israel. I think the, the interest of, of Israel and, and the wealth that they have in their, their gas fields and, and potential oil fields. But can you imagine if there's treasures buried in the sand? And not just gold and silver by its weight, but the valuable things, the artifacts and, and the intense value that they have. You know, just this week, in a personal way, it was very interesting because Mark Lynch said my nephew was in Israel with a group, not many groups going there now, with a man by the name of Byron Simpson, is the one who actually brought the five red heifers to Israel. And Mark and the group with him, they got to go to Shiloh to visit these red heifers. Actually, they, they, they fed them. And to hear the excitement of the preparation for the ashes of the red heifer, for the purification of the priest. All these things are taking place right now. God's timing is perfect. I really believe we're living in the last days. And with this kind of thing going on, I really believe that Christ could come before we even find the treasures. I believe that Christ could come before they ever, ever sacrifice one of the red heifers. But I think those things are going to take place. And I think they're going to take place soon. Maybe those are tribulation events. But before the tribulation, you need to be ready for Jesus to come. And so again today, I invite you. I invite you to receive Christ as your personal Savior. Not just to know that he was a historical fact. Not just to know that he really had his feet on the ground in Israel, in Jerusalem, and in that whole area. No, I want you to go further. I want you to have a personal relationship with him. To say, Jesus Christ, I want you to be my Savior. I accept your blood shed. I accept your death, your burial. And your resurrection is the payment for my sin, and you are my salvation. And if so, you can have him as your Savior today. Then, let me tell you, you'll be so excited as you see these events unfolding, because I think we're living in the last days. God bless you. We'll see you next week.